Grace and peace to you as we gather in the Lord's name to offer our worship to the risen and living Lord. A few announcements as we gather. You'll find these in your Friday news or in the bulletin. Um, you can find the bulletin on the homepage of our website. Uh, so to lift up a few of the announcements, you'll see a notice about youth group happening on Sunday afternoon, the 25th. Uh, Max will conclude on Wednesday night, the 28th, with Trunk or Treat, uh, which will be a hot dog supper out in the parking lot along with Trunk or Treat. If you plan to bring a car and to offer treats for um, young and old, uh, let Brandon know by email so we can make arrangements in the parking lot to accommodate your vehicle. Um, and then come join us for supper and treats that night. Uh, we have an outreach collection that's designated for migrant farm workers and there you'll see in the newsletter times when you can stop by to, to make those drop-offs. Um, on Sunday the 1st, uh, a week hence, um, that'll be a first Sunday of the month and so we'd invite you to drive through the parking lot and collect some communion elements so you'll be ready for morning worship on the no on November 1st to join us for communion. Um, would invite you back that afternoon. We'll gather on this side of the sanctuary in the Memorial Garden uh, to remember all the saints who have left us. Um, it's a meaningful way to augment your work of grief as you gather with others in worship. You'll see deadlines about getting names of your loved ones into the bulletin. Um, and then uh, November 4th, we'll gather on Zoom to offer prayers for peace, given that we will have had a, a national election the day prior. And then be ready to join with us on November 8th as we consecrate our pledges uh, toward the 2021 financial year of our church. Um, I hope that the announcements you've been hearing and the preaching you've been hearing is bringing you to a place where your giving would be out of uh, a gratitude for God's generosity to you, that you would want to be a part of this church being generous back to the world. Uh, so consider, consider your pledge and then plan on coming to church on November 8th to pick up lunch. Uh, we need your reservation for that lunch, even as you leave behind your written pledge so that uh, we might know of your commitments. Um, again, all of those announcements are on our website and in Friday news, I would commend those and additional ones to you as you find ways to worship, grow and serve. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Friends, please join me in the call to worship. The responses are at the bottom of your screen. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the laws and the prophets. Let us worship the Lord.
there's a, I mean, there's lots of stories like this in the New Testament, but I was, as I was thinking about doing the confession sequence, I thought about a story in Acts where there is a jailer, a person who had jailed Paul and Peter. And, I mean, talk about an enemy, right? But then there's the earthquake and their escape from prison, but then they stay where they are. And by the end of the story, this, this jailer is converted to the way, the way of Jesus Christ, and baptized him and his whole family. And it, I mean, it is at these waters, these waters of baptism, not only where we receive and we are claimed by God and we receive God's grace, but where, where enemies come together and all of that dissolves away and there's nothing but love of God and love of neighbor. So as you meditate upon that, as we silently confess our sins at this time, listen to these waters. Amen. Now, let us continue confessing in one voice. Lord, we confess we do not live as those worthy to be entrusted with the good news of your grace. We relate to others callously as though we do not trust the gospel ourselves. We seek to please and manipulate, using flattery to gain praise and distinction. We use condescension as a mask to cover insecurity or a need for power. Our motives are mixed, impure. Lord, reassure and cleanse us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Reassure and cleanse us. If we confess our sins, we know that God is faithful and just to forgiveness of our sins and cleanse us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so hear this good news today, that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are loved and accepted, forgiven and free. Thanks be to God. And since we are at peace with God, we can also be at peace with one another because we, because we were enemies of God, but in Jesus Christ we have peace with God. We can now be at peace with one another and love one another. And so the peace of Christ be with you. Our first lesson is Leviticus chapter 19 at verse 1 and 2, 15 through 19. In preparation for hearing God's word, let us pray. Lord Jesus, your understanding of Scripture astonished and humbled all around you. Send your Spirit to illumine our, this word that our understanding and wisdom may be increased. Amen. Listen with me for what the Spirit says. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord.
Our second lesson is from Matthew 22. This is our third week in Matthew 22, and the Sadducees have been trying to catch Jesus in a trap by testing him on issues of the resurrection, marriage, and taxes. This all goes back to Matthew 21, when Jesus had his triumphal entry to Jerusalem, and then the following parables that really lay into the religious leaders. For our passage, Jesus has dispensed or rendered speechless, verbally penned the Sadducees, and then the Pharisees step up. Listen with me now for what the Spirit will say to us today. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to, ha to ask him any more questions. From our reading in Leviticus 19 and here from Matthew 22, this has been the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's time to spend some time with the younger church. So if you consider yourself a part of the younger church, come on in closer toward the screen so you can see pictures as I read today's lesson out of our Spark Story Bible. This story is about Jesus teaching us about the greatest commandment. Now the Pharisees were a group of people who had lots and lots of laws. Altogether, they had more than 600. Can you imagine that? That is a lot of rules to follow. One day, one of the Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest law? He did not think Jesus could pick just one law out of so many. He was trying to trick Jesus. But Jesus knew that the man was trying to trick him. So he looked at the man and he smiled. Love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, Jesus said, this is the greatest of all of the commandments. But there's another really important one too. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you obey these two laws, then you obey all of the laws. Can you imagine two laws to cover for 600? The Pharisees' jaws dropped to the floor. They were shocked to know just how smart Jesus was, and they were surprised that Jesus had answered their question and turned their trick around on them. They did not know what to say. Then Jesus had a question for them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now that was an easy question for the Pharisees. They, they grew up learning in school that the Messiah came from the family of David. So that's what they told Jesus. Then why do all the people from the family of David praise David as the Messiah, Jesus asked. Now that was a hard question. The Pharisees did not have an answer. They backed away and they didn't trick Jesus again. Thank you for joining me for that good story about the greatest commandment. 
Join me in saying thanks be to God. Let's get ready. Bring it down. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep within us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Amen. There's a podcast that I love listening to called The Rewatchables. It's a podcast where the hosts choose popular movies from usually like the 80s, 90s, 2000s that people have seen tons of times and they just talk about them. Movies like Caddyshack, Gladiator, or Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And the host, all they do is just rehash these movies. It's a lot of fun because the podcast gives you something that you're comfortable with. The movies are so familiar that it's not like there's any new information or challenge. It's just easy listening. And the command to love God and love our neighbor has become, I think, for a lot of people, even me, a rewatchable. I've heard this passage about as many times as I've seen Gladiator. Most of us can probably say the same thing. We're so familiar with love God and love your neighbor that there's no challenge, no sting. It's just easy listening. But one thing that has stuck out to me in Matthew is how combative and confrontational the gospel of Jesus Christ is, both then and now. So I pray that maybe on this, uh, this rewatch of Love God and Love Our Neighbor will be a bit unsettled this time around. On my rewatch, I was struck by the fact that Jesus' teaching on loving our neighbor comes in the context of these tests, these traps, that the religious leaders, both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, are laying out for Jesus. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this teaching on love is in the context of direct confrontation with religious leaders. Matthew really turns it up a notch, though, from Mark or Luke. In Mark, one of the teachers of the law asks about the greatest commandment, and Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. Then the lawyer responds, you are right. In Luke, another teacher of the law asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, Well, what's written in the law? The lawyer answers, Love the Lord your God and love the neighbor and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, You've answered correctly. In Matthew, Jesus has silenced the Sadducees already, and now some Pharisees try to test him. One of these Pharisees, a lawyer, steps up to test Jesus. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. And then there's silence. There's no response from the Pharisees. After two chapters, two chapters of back and forth with questions and answers and tests and traps, Jesus leaves the Pharisees speechless. In fact, the end of the passage said that from this point on, no one dared to question Jesus again. There is something confrontational 
about saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's confrontational because we think we can separate love for God and love for neighbor. That we can do one without doing the other. And that's the real power of Jesus' response to this lawyer. How he maneuvers the trap and entraps the lawyer all in about five seconds. The lawyer knows Jesus' first statement is right. Any good Israelite with a pulse knew Jesus is right. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Israelites are to teach these words to their children. This command is the basis of their welfare in the promised land. They are to, hand these word, these, they are to hang these words on the doors of their homes and bind them to their hands and even to their forehead. But Jesus keeps it going in an unexpected direction. He says, and there's a second one, a second one that's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And now he's quoting Leviticus 19, what, what John read earlier. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness is tied directly to love of neighbor. And here, Jesus does the same thing. They are inseparable. To love God is to love your neighbor. To love your neighbor is to love God. If you say you love God but don't love your neighbor, then your love for God is false, and at worst, it's a facade. We know Jesus has tied these commands together because right after this, he will let loose on the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And the core, the core of their hypocrisy is thinking that they can love God without loving their neighbor. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites! You are whitewashed tombs. You appear to people as righteous, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You tie up heavy burdens, but you don't lift a finger to help someone carry the load. Tying these two commands together has been a tension throughout the whole gospel. Talking about healing on the Sabbath, questions about fasting, eating with tax collectors and sinners, this is what Jesus was doing in the, in the entire Sermon on the Mount. Taking the Torah, the law, and drawing it down to the ground where love of God touches love of neighbor. In what ways have we separated these two commands? In what ways have we bought into the lie that being a Christ follower means that my soul is saved and I live by the principles and values Jesus taught. At that point, we have left the ground and we're living in the sky somewhere. Jesus is not a principle or a value. Jesus is the whole point. And he lived his life loving God and loving his neighbor, even to the point of death on a cross. And his life is the claim on our life. It's confrontational. It's confrontational because we think we know who our neighbor is. But Jesus challenges that. 
What Jesus' words ought to make us do is ask, well, who is my neighbor? In Luke, we get that answer in that story that we all know, the story of the Good Samaritan. The one acting as a neighbor is the one you would naturally just hate. In Matthew, Jesus lays this out in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment. Therefore, I tell you, if you're about to offer your sacrifice at the altar and realize your brother or sister has something against you, drop what you're doing and go reconcile. Love God, love your neighbor, love God. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one. If someone sues you for your shirt, go ahead and give them your coat. If someone forces you to go one mile, take that pack a second mile. Love God, love your neighbor, love God. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, what good is that? Even pagans do that. Love God, love your neighbor, love God. That's the real rub, man. The other night, our neighbor had to go to the ER suddenly, and so Taylor and I watched her daughter for a little bit. And I thought for this sermon, hey, there's a, there's a real good practical example of loving your neighbor. You know, I'm starting to feel pretty good about myself. Then Jesus stops me in my tracks. Nope. Anybody would do that. Helping someone who would help you, loving someone who already loves you back, what good is that? The real test comes with those who are nothing like us. Don't think the way we think. Don't believe the way we believe. Don't look like us. The people we wouldn't want to be caught dead with. Who are those people for you? Who are those people for me? Who are those people for us? Who would we rather not be with? Who do we refuse to commune with? Who do we hate? These are questions that I'm guessing we'd rather not ask ourselves, but be bold enough to ask it. And then we know who we need to start loving. Love God, love your neighbor. It's confrontational because love is complicated. On the surface, love God and love your neighbor is the simplest thing. But when you start doing it, when you start trying to do it, you realize that it is not so simple. Love can't stay up in the sky. Love has to touch the ground. Love has to manifest itself in concrete actions for our neighbors. That means we have to know our neighbors intimately. We have to know their struggles, their needs, their vulnerabilities, and then join them in those needs, struggles, and vulnerabilities. But let's even make it more specific. I've done a lot of visiting with people over the past month or so, calling around, meeting with people, trying to reconnect. If there is a common theme in all of these conversations, then it is shared fear, concern, anxiety about the future of our country. More specifically, 
about the days between whenever you're watching this and November 3rd. People really think that they have nothing in common with, with each other, but what I've observed is that most people care about the same thing and they just have a different way of thinking about it. What is one concrete way to love your neighbor in the next few days? Who's the person? Who's the person who has become nothing but a Facebook avatar for you? Who is the person you think is absolutely crazy and can't even imagine having a conversation with them? Who's the person you have reduced down to the news channel they watch and what you think, what you think they are as liberal or conservative? Figure that out. And then figure out a concrete way to love that person. Just start with one. And don't hear me saying something like, well, can't we all just get along? Or, hey, you do you, I'll do me. Or, let's agree to disagree. Or, let's call truce. Go to our corners. I am suggesting something far more radical. I'm su suggesting that we actually follow Jesus and love our neighbors. The person we don't associate with, we don't like, we don't trust, we don't live among. In concrete, tangible sacrificial ways. When we do that, then we'll know that we are loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and we are loving our neighbors as ourselves. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week we continue through the Confession of 1967. Let us say together what we believe. Out of Israel, God in due time raised up Jesus. His faith and obedience were the response of the perfect child of God. He was the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel, the beginning of the new creation and the pioneer of new humanity. He gave history its meaning and direction and called the church to be his servant for the reconciliation of the world. Being a little girl and seeing the brass offering plates being passed around hand by hand, I didn't understand what the significance was, why we did this and where did the money go. I do remember hearing praise God from home all blessings flow and knowing that was a signal for the ushers to walk forward and present the offering plates onto the communion table. Now, as I became older and understood what tithing meant, I then realized the thread of tithing that had begun and still is being woven into my faith journey. All those splendid church memories were made possible by others and their giving. Without those contributions, I don't think I'd still be the same Christian woman I am today. I've been at North Raleigh Presbyterian Church for eight years. I see how tithing not only has affected me, but my children. I see the blessings of vacation Bible school, Christmas plays, Max, Christmas cantata, meals shared, Sunday school, youth group, all these things made possible through tithes. You know, tithing is the lifeblood that keeps the church moving forward. It's one way to worship God, to honor Him as our provider, and a reminder that all resources, they really belong to Him. In good times, it helps us to know that God is the source of all blessings, and it shows gratitude for His care. And then in hard times, Tithing, it motivates you to remember God's faithfulness 
and our dependence on God to provide for all of our needs. As a Christian steward, we know that all that we have and all that we are comes freely from God. In Matthew 6, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. You know, stewardship, it involves an active participation, a responsibility of managing our God-given resources, which are our time, our talents, and our treasure. Will you please prefer preferably consider what gifts you can generously bestow upon others at NRPC? Commitment cards have been mailed. We hope for you to present them on November 8th, Consecration Sunday, at the 1130 Takeout Luncheon. And now as a sign of our dedication to discipleship, let us present to God our tithes and our offerings. Grateful for the many ways God has entered our lives, let us worship God as we offer our prayers for ourselves, for our world, and for all of creation. Friends, let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. When I say, Holy God, I'd invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. We are indeed grateful, O oh God, that you have provided for this world and for your church and for us uh, as long as there has been a world. And so we give you thanks. And we bring before you the concerns that we hold, the ones that we hold dear in our hearts, the ones that are beyond naming and the ones that we name in this prayer. Even as we pray, Holy God, hear our prayer. Gracious God, for the sake of all that this earth does need and for the needs of all of our churches, hear us as we pray. For people of faith in every land, in every religion, and in every home, holy God, hear our prayer. For the Church of Christ served these two millennia by so many saints who've gone before us, holy God, hear our prayer. For those in our midst who will be the saints of the church long after so many of us have walked this earth, O oh God, hear our prayers that they would lead your church in new ways, in new seasons. Holy God, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for world leaders, for peacemakers, for diplomats, and for work government workers. We pray for health care workers and for teachers and for all who serve us in the midst of this pandemic, holy God, hear our prayers. For trees and plants, for the creatures that roam this earth large and small, for the pets we love and for animals who work, for the oceans, for the air and for the soil, holy God, hear our prayer that we would be stewards of all that you have created, O oh God, grateful stewards who praise you in the way that we care for your world. Holy God, hear our prayer. For farmers in this time of harvest, for those who fish and hunt, for those who ship and store what is gathered, and for those who cook and serve. Holy God, hear our prayer. For those without food and without shelter, for those who long for meaningful work, for those who long for work that will provide for their needs, holy God, hear our prayer. For children in schools, for teachers and parents, and for those who have no schools, holy God, hear our prayer. For all of the things that this church is concerned about this day, those things that are held deeply in us, hear our prayers in silence. Holy God, hear our prayer. And for those many prayers we know not how to name, and for those known only to you, Holy God, hear our prayer. We trust, O oh God, that you indeed hear our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord, who has taught us to pray 
and to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The, the charge, I already put it out there in the sermon, but the, the charge is to go out from your time of worship, find that person. Who is that person? Figure out a concrete way to love your enemy. And as you do that thing, that hard, hard, complicated, not simple thing, loving your neighbor, as you do that thing, may the love of God and the peace of Christ be with you, with those you love, and especially with those who no one loves. Mm -hmm. 